All right. Uh, welcome back from midterm break. It appears to have uh, people appear to have forgotten what time class starts, but we'll we'll continue on without them. Uh, hope everyone had some rest and, and relaxation over the break. Uh, I want to jump right into it. Kind of get our get our brains back into assembly and particularly back into that buffer overflows. Uh, will become uh, relevant with uh, lab three and talk more about that. Uh, but first, just uh, circling back for a bit of review about accessing memory uh, with arrays and structs. So in the piece of code here, uh, I have a struct which has a character and then an array of four integers and then a pointer to a character. Uh, and I want to implement this get elem function, which takes in a pointer to one of these structs, takes in an index, and returns the integer at that index out of the array A inside the struct. And this get elem uh, uh, function, I want to implement it in assembly. And uh, my question is, which instruction plus uh, an RET, a return, is going to implement this? Or will it perhaps take uh, more than one instruction plus the return in order to implement this? So uh, take a moment to consider that. Uh, a, B, or, or D are the uh, popular ones. Please discuss with your neighbors uh, why you chose uh, the answer you did. Evenly divided between A and B looks like. Uh, B is what we will need to implement this function. Um, there's, uh, can uh, someone share how you thought about the different parts of this move instruction and how that matched up uh, with the secret? Huh. So we sort of talked about how in the struct we knew that um, it would be like multiples of, of four basically in terms of stored bytes because um, you run a line with your struct and the array is it's like a, there's four things in the array. Um, and so you need to multiply by four and then you're also sort of like, or you sorry, you're adding four to get to the end of your array. You're also multiplying by four um, to take the index and translate that to just you can grab from the array itself. Exactly. The, uh, these ints have to be aligned at a multiple, or well, they don't have to be, they will be uh, aligned at a multiple of four. So even though this character is one byte, the array will actually start four bytes uh, into the struct, which is where this sort of offset of four comes from, as Connor said. And then we have our index being multiplied by four. Why is it multiplied by four? And where does that four come from? Clock? So I thought the multiplied by four would relate to the parameter of RSI, um, the index, but I said it's long, and I thought long for A. So the number in RSI is an eight byte integer, but we're using it as an index into an array of ints. And so for each index we go into the array, we're going four bytes further into the array, because each of those integers is four bytes. Yeah, so four is the size of an integer is where that comes from. Why? But doesn't the, I guess, because of the fact that it is divided up to four, the, the struct, isn't the struct going to take up eight bytes because of the fact that you're, it's yeah <clears throat> I'm not aware of a compiler that will actually reorder the field so uh, the expectation, at least, is that the fields will appear in whatever order they appear in the C code. So we'll have a one byte character, three bytes of internal fragmentation padding, and then our array of four integers, and then the eight bytes of our pointer. 
And so because we have an eight byte pointer, the total size of the struct needs to be a multiple of eight. Uh, but for accessing this array A, we just we only care about where that array starts within the struct. Uh, and for that, we have our character, our three bytes of padding, and then A0, 1, 2, 3, each of which is four bytes in size. That makes, I'm sorry, that makes perfect sense. I thought it was, I thought it was an array of structs, but not mm. I think. Um, I am just a little confused. Um, I know you explained this in the other class. Um, but why is it three bytes of internal padding as opposed to like the whole thing being eight bytes? Since the next like more just one in the thing is eight. Uh, so the thing we're aligning here is this integer. As well, like okay, where does this integer come within the struct? The integer is four bytes, and so our alignment rule says it should be stored at an address that's a multiple of four. So we're just assuming that the struct starts at something that's a multiple of four. Uh, and then we go one byte in for the character, and then to get this to a multiple of four, that's where the three comes from. Okay. Oh, there's more than four bytes. So the, the fact that the, the, the type of the parameter is not in there, is along the time, doesn't actually matter, right? Like, if you just go above the... <coughs> Uh, you would definitely not run into an out of bounds error, given that C never gives you that error. Um, you, if you go beyond index three, you get four bytes of the pointer, then the next four bytes of the pointer, and then you'd be into memory past the struct. Uh, eventually, you may hit memory you're not allowed to access, which would give you a segmentation. Any other questions on this? Yeah. Yeah. Again, just for clarification purposes, if you were to order your struct as like char pointer, int array, uh, character, uh, you would, would you get an 841 no padding situation? Or no, it doesn't have the end. Uh, you would end up with external fragmentation on the end uh, because we need the entire size of the struct to be a multiple of eight. Because if we were to put have an array of these structs, yeah. we'd want each element in the array to still be aligned to a multiple of eight. All right, let's now practice uh, thinking about buffer overflows. Um, so let me make the code bigger for a moment. Uh, so we have a, a vulnerable function. And I've highlighted just the relevant assembly instructions here. Uh, we have some allocation on the stack. We have uh, an instruction that sets up the argument that's going to be passed to gets. Anyone remember what the gets function does? Angela? Exactly. It's going to take whatever is given as input on the terminal, standard input, uh, and just write that to the address that is passed in this argument, kind of starting at that address. So uh, the no limit part is what makes this function vulnerable. Uh, and my question for you is, what is the minimum number of characters that this call to gets needs to read? So how many characters, what is the minimum number we'd have to enter on the command line? Uh, in order to change the return address to a stack address. Uh, and so I've, I'm going to give you specific addresses here. The current return address before the call to gets is this 8-byte address here, uh, 405d1. And I want to change it to an address like this, starting with 7FFF. That's a, a signal that this is a, maybe an address on the stack. So this is the sort of kind of uh, the kind of style of overflow that you might use for a, a code injection attack. But we want to change the address return address from this to 7ff uh, uh, cafe food um, uh, c a f e o f 0 0 d. So uh, think about how many total bytes uh, would we need to give as input? What is the minimum number uh, in order to override our return address uh, like this. 
So, a variety of uh, first guesses. Please discuss with your neighbor um, kind of how gets will affect memory and how that relates to overriding the return address. All right. Some movement toward 54. That's what I like to see. That's indeed how many bytes we'll have to, to input uh, to get this, get this change. Um, so if I'm drawing a picture of the stack and uh, kind of before vulnerable starts, I'll just say RSP is here. And if what's, and someone uh, walk us through sort of what happens on the stack and how that relates to uh, needing to input 54 bytes. Nick? I can do it if I can ask a question. Sure. Uh, so the first thing we do is we take 64 bytes, uh, or subtract 64 bytes from RSP. We're going to down a little bit. Uh, this is, the next instruction is the one I look at. Why are we loading RSP plus 16 with the RDI and then calling the ends? Here. So, what are we pass like? What is what is the argument that gets takes? Yeah. So it gets takes a pointer to where it should start writing the input. Uh, and in this example, the array have, that is being used to store this input is not doesn't start at the top of the stack, it starts 16 bytes up. Okay. It just happens to be where it's located. Gotcha. So then, so we're at where, wherever RSP was originally, minus 40. Yeah, so we have some buffer that starts here. We know that this is 48, or hex 30. Uh, so then we got to write up 48 um, plus, you want to change this pointer, but you don't have to change the the two most significant bytes. So you only need to write six additional bytes on 48. Yeah, so this is this is the key. We know that the return address is going to be stored at the top of the stack when the function starts. So that's how we know that how many bytes are between the value that gets passed to get, the address that gets passed to get, and where the return address is. Uh, and then little endian means that our return address is stored kind of least significant byte first. So B1, 0, 5, 40. Uh, and one, one more set of zeros. Uh, and then we just want to overwrite, as Nick said, kind of the six bytes um, uh, here to change those to this stack address, and these last two, they can just stay zero. So we're thinking about the minimum we have to input. Uh, it's this 48 plus 6 to get 54. I see. Wait, so is the stack, is the uh, return address a vulnerable, the, the function, right? Is it pushed onto the stack before you subtract 40? Yes, so when, whenever, when, when, we don't see it here, but in order for this function to happen at all, at some point there was a call call vulnerable instruction. This instruction first pushed the return address onto the stack and then jumped to the first instruction of, of vulnerable. So that means that when we first start vulnerable, the very last thing that happened before we got here was that the return address was pushed onto the stack. Return address of vulnerable? That's right. Not the return address of the function that called vulnerable? vulnerable? Uh, so I guess, what is, how are you what is the difference between those two things? Um, how else would it know like, where to go back to? I thought it was the, the function that would call vulnerable. Yeah, so, so however you want to think about it, whether it's the return address of vulnerable or the previous function, what is here is the address that the program should go back to when vulnerable is done executing. Gotcha. So I think of that as vulnerable's return address, because it's where vulnerable should return to. Um, but phrasing it differently may make more sense to you. But yeah, it's where we go back to when this function's over. Other questions?
All right, so this is uh, precisely the kind of analysis you will need to do to execute your own buffer overflow attacks. You will look at the assembly of a vulnerable executable, and you will figure out, okay, what do I need to input to change the stack in a specific way? So uh, I'd like to walk through some parts of this assignment. Um, mostly some of the tools that you'll need to use because uh, they uh, uh, can be a little tricky. So if we look at the course calendar, we have lab three, the attack lab, and this is similar to lab two in form that you're going to download already compiled executables, execute, uh, kind of devise way, uh, specific attacks on those executables, and success will be automatically sent uh, to, to a server, and so there will not be anything to separately submit for this lab, just sort of uh, uh, successfully executing these attacks while connected to the internet is uh, how you submit your work. So like before, there'll be a site that you can go to um, in theory. In theory, all right, let me see uh, if I can I see. There. Okay. There are a million lines in this. Okay. Something has uh, uh, gone wrong. I see. Maybe it's related to DHS scanning this machine. I've been seeing that a lot. Um, government seems very interested. Uh, all right. So there's something that's uh, sad about the server right now. Um, apparently not. <laughs> all right. So. Anyway, if it, I will make sure that it's it's stable um, after after we're done here. But I put in my username and email address, hit submit, uh, and it will have me download a tar file. We'll see if this actually works. Um, but once you have the tar file, you can connect to Mantis and drag it over uh, to the files there to upload it to Mantis. Since you will need to work on a Linux machine, you can also uh, work on a, a local uh, VM. Uh, yes, this looks sad. I will close that. Um, that one. So, I fortunately previously downloaded a uh, one of these targets. So it'll be target and then some number. So let's say I'm I'm working with this uh, target five. There are. Uh, two different vulnerable executables that you are given uh, spread over the uh, five kind of phases of the lab. Uh, the first three will uh, be applied to C target. These will be code injection attacks. Uh, and then the last two will be applied to R target, which has the address space randomization and the stack not executable. Um, or at least the stack not executable is enabled uh, for this R target. Uh, and so you'll need to use a different strategy called return oriented programming, uh, which is described in the lab write up for those. Um, so just to show you what running these looks like, uh, if I run C target, uh, each one has a unique uh, cookie, and th the value of this cookie will be involved in some of the attacks that you'll be mounting. So it just prints that out. And then it's asking me to type the string as input. Um, and if I type some short input, I don't get a buffer overflow, or at least not one that causes problems. And it says normal return, there was, there was no exploit. Uh, if I run it and put in some very long input, as you might imagine, Blasted over the return address with uh, a bunch of, uh, I think, hex 65, lowercase a, cause segmentation fault. Uh, and so there are specific things you'll want to do to like have the program say not return normally, but return to some other function. So you'll be needing to overwrite the return address. Um, 
in specific ways. Uh, so the first phase is just overwrite the return address with a specific thing. All the other phases involve overwriting the return address, but also setting up a specific argument to the function you're redirecting the program to. So it's like, read, override the return address to call this other function, but also this other function takes a, a parameter that you need to set up correctly kind of before you end up executing it. Um, all of this means that uh, um, you need to kind of input specific hex values to uh, 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 to these uh, to these targets, and let's say you needed to input the hex value 0, 8 as part of uh, as part of your your exploit. Well, if I look at ASCII values, I see that 0, 8 in hex is the backspace character. It's probably hard to type in backspaces in the terminal, so we're going to need some other way of putting of putting an input. Uh, to these uh, to these targets where we can precisely control what hex values get input. Fortunately, the lab provides tools for doing this. So there are a bunch of these empty files, C target dot phase one through three, R target dot phase four and five, that are just provided for you to kind of put your input to um, to the different phases in these files. Uh, and so let's say that I want to let me make this not tiny. Uh, I want to imp I want the the exploit to be kind of hex 65, uh, then um, 32, uh, 08, uh, 74, something like this. Um, and instead of having to figure out, oh, how do I type those in? Uh, there's a file hex 2 raw that is provided as part of the lab that will take hex values formatted like this, where each one is separated by a space, each one is two, uh, two characters, uh, and turn it into the sort of raw ASCII text. So that when that text is read into memory by the vulnerable program, it will show up in memory as exactly these bytes. So if I say I could use cat to print out the contents of C target dot phase one and you can see that it's there. Uh, and on in the terminal I can take the output of one command and send it a, and send it as the input to another command. This is called piping. So I can pipe the output of this command in, uh, and use it as the input to the command of running this hex to raw program. And when I do that, I see that hex to raw said it's E, then a T, and then a backspace, and then 74, which we can see what is 74. 74 is the T, so the backspace got rid of the 32, uh, which was a 2. Um, when we when we printed it out, but um, and so I'm kind of turning these hex values of bytes into the string that will cause those hex values to show up in memory. Uh, and so I could take the output of this hex to raw and pipe that into the input of C target, and it will read kind of these four characters uh, and write them into memory. Uh, so this is the way I can take any hex values I want, turn the, uh, and, and kind of feed them into the, the target to get those hex values to show up in memory. Uh, the one exception is uh, you can't, uh, you won't, uh, you can't use the hex value zero uh, a because that's the new line and that will cause the targets to assume the input is over because it reads until it sees a new line. Uh, so zero a. Uh, won't, won't work, but all the other kind of hex values will. Uh, questions on this so far? Uh, how this works or why we need this? Uh, how, would, how would you get around the 
around that, um, say you need zero A for the address of something, what do you do? Um, I mean, fortunately, you won't need that. Um, And off the top of my head, I think you would have to uh, have your exploit uh, run exploit code that then put the 0A where you needed it. Because um, the 0A as part of the input is going to prevent whatever you need to come after it from, from being read. PJ? Why do you want to input like multiple files? Uh, so this program cat is actually short for concatenate. So I can actually cat um, if I cat the cookie file and the C target phase one file, it will actually just combine all of those together. And the C target will be those two like separate code, right? Or do I need to put in like new line between? Uh, so, nice thing about this hex to raw program is that it, we can separate out these this input on, on separate lines, and we can even put comments in these files, and hex to raw will ignore it. So, if you have something like this with this slash asterisk asterisk slash, this is a way to, as you're designing these inputs, to kind of have comments to help you keep track of where things are that won't mess with the input. Um, so if I look back at, um, oh, I need to save this. So I can see that I just have these three E's and it's not trying to turn all of this. If I say forgot to put a space around one of the comment characters, then I get into, I think it's actually, if I forget to put a space after the start, it's not going to recognize that as a comment. Um, and it's going to say, like, I can't turn slash star this. Can't interpret that as two digit hex number. Um, other questions? Fine. So, with this, um, before when you were running stuff, you would have to. Um, we only had one thing that we would use as the input because there was only one thing to run. But this, how do how you get multiple um, multiple phase things into as the input from one? Uh, so you'll only need one phase at a time because unlike the bomb, the phases are not like you don't have to do them in a certain order. Um, kind of each phase is is separate. So if you're working on phase two, you'll just have your input for phase two for that, and separately an input for phase one. Does that make sense? Or is that what you were asking? It's the same. It, the phases is really just dependent on what you're what you are supposed to do to the exactly. Um, so a big part of this is going to involve putting code onto the stack and causing the program to execute this exploit code that you inserted into its memory. Uh, and so you'll need some way to get, uh, to go from, say, assembly that you hand wrote yourself to perform your exploit into the raw hex values that should be the input to the program to cause the, that assembly to show up on the stack. And to do this, I can have an assembly file. Maybe I want to push uh, the number 100 onto the stack. Then I want to move uh, RAX to RDI. Something like this. I, 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 this is, these are the instructions that I want to show up on the stack uh, that, will, that will cause my exploit. Um, 
So I have this exploit.s. What do I do with it? Um, well, I can compile this and say gcc c exploit.s. Um, and this has created an exploit.o file. And then I can use object dump on exploit.o to see these are the five bytes, 6a, 64, 4889c7, that were this, were kind of the, the byte values of that assembly uh, when compiled to machine code. And so if, then I can just take uh, these bytes, and these are what I would put in my input to get those instructions to show up uh, on the program stack. So I would just say, all right, I have 6a, then 6.4, then 4.8, then 8.9, then c7. And uh, those five bytes will cause, uh, if interpreted as instructions, will be this push uh, and then this move. Does that make sense? All right, so that's uh, kind of the, the two new kind of tools that we'll uh, be using in this lab to develop these, these exploits. The write-up has uh, more information about these. Um, any other questions on lab three before we move on? All right, it's out today. Check and post is going to be due on Monday, 9 p.m., with the lab due one week from today, uh, next Wednesday, 9 p.m. All right, so uh, the rest of our, our time today, we're going to kind of begin our look into, kind of up until now, we've been looking sort of at the, the part of the system that's the instruction set architecture and the compiler. Like, how does the assembly actually implement these things like procedure calls, structs, arrays, what have you? And kind of for the rest of the course, we're going to kind of be moving up our layers of, of abstraction, kind of next focusing on the operating system and the standard library, and how does that actually make memory work? How does malloc work? How does free work? How do programs get the memory that they use? Things like that. Um, so first uh, step on that today, uh, but uh, before we do that, I need to tell you about bird poop and American Empire. So uh, particularly the first overseas territory of the U.S. Uh, was not uh, the territory the U.S. seized from Spain, such as Puerto Rico uh, or Cuba or the Philippines um, in uh, the war in, in 1898. It was actually a law Congress passed in 1856 called the Guano Islands Act. At this time, uh, guano, meaning poop, was valuable, particularly as fertilizer. Um, and so Congress passed a law that said, all right, if you come across uh, a guano island, an island that is rich in poop, and there's no one living there, and you take control of it, then it kind of becomes a possession of the United States. Um, the United States would, at one, uh, at one point or another, claim around 100 islands under this law, uh, ranging from uh, one of the, uh, there are a couple of uh, advertisements here for of, uh, uh, a true bird guano, rich in phosphates and alkaline salts. Um, but one of the first was Baker Island, uh, which is in the South Pacific, but they were kind of all over the place. There's uh, Isla de Aves um, in the Caribbean. And these days, most of these islands have been, uh, are, are no longer claimed by the United States. Many were uh, transferred to other countries through various treaties, but uh, about, I don't know, one to two dozen or so remain um, part, of, part of the US, including Midway Island, which uh, was the, the site of a, a famous naval battle in World War II. All right. so. That's, that's our, our history. Let's talk about malloc and free.
So there are two big questions that we're going to focus on uh, over the next several weeks, um, or, or next couple weeks. Uh, first is, how do we manage the scarce physical resource that is the memory, uh, the scarce resource that is physical memory on our, on our systems. Because we want to provide each running program with the memory it needs. And there needs to be some way of determining kind of which programs get what memory and making sure uh, that we don't say give one program all the memory we have and then no other program can run. Uh, and so this is going to be our operating system plus actually the system's hardware are where this management is going to come from. Second question. actually implement malloc and free in a way that's both fast and efficient. Because someone, someone has to implement malloc and free. They don't just emerge out of the ether. Um, and this is part of the C standard library. That the C library or uh, some kind of similar library is what is implementing these, these uh, functions here. And even though these functions are you know, implemented by the standard library, being able to use them well involves understanding how they're actually functioning underneath. Like what it means, what it actually means when you call malloc and free, why do they have the properties they have, so for that reason, we're going to look in detail at how they work, and you will actually implement your own versions of malloc and free uh, in lab four. So because lab four will, um, implementing malloc and free will be the subject of lab four, we're going to talk about question two, and then come back to question one. So malloc and free are Our kind of their implementation is a memory allocator. Like some uh, programs, some set of functions that's responsible for managing what memory gets allocated and how. And there are kind of two types of, uh, of kind of two general categories of memory allocators. There's explicit allocators, meaning that we have a manual requests that sort of explicitly in the code, we say allocate memory here, free memory here. And we tell it exactly how much memory to allocate and exactly which memory to free. And C is a malloc and free are an example of an explicit. We also have implicit allocators. Um, and these are the allocators that are automatic. That when the program uh, does something that would require additional memory, and in the background, that memory is allocated. Uh, and 
it, when the program is done using memory, there is some automatic mechanism that's going to free that. Uh, we, it's not going to really work if we never free memory. Only very small programs uh, would be viable if we just only allocated and, and never freed. Question? Um, I was, yeah, I was going to ask, so like an example of that, um, when stuff is um, like creating or popping stack frame, would that be implicit? So I would say yes, that would be implicit allocation. Um, but kind of more, more, but it's not kind of a general purpose allocation. It's only allocating just on the stack for these specific function calls. So um, a common kind of implicit allocator is called garbage collection. Uh, this is a, a pretty old idea um, in computer science, but uh, kind of only more recently has it become kind of what every new programming language does. Um, Python and Java are both examples of language languages that have garbage collector, uh, garbage collectors. And the basic idea is uh, in Python, when I say declare a list and then I append things to it, kind of nowhere in there uh, in Python do I have to say like allocate more memory. It's all sort of happening in the background uh, as part of these operations. Uh, and so I have this list sitting around in memory, and the idea of a garbage collector is um, there are different forms, but when there's when this list is no longer being used by any part of the program, the garbage collector can identify this, and at that point will free that memory. So it generally takes the form of either uh, every so often a kind of program running in the background will go through all the things in memory and check, can I throw this away? Um, kind of do a sweep of memory and uh, free stuff at that point. Um, the other common strategy is something called reference counting, where the runtime keeps track of how many kind of references, how many pointers are there to a particular piece of memory. And when there are no more pointers to a piece of memory, well, then no one can use it, and it's OK to free that. Um, but this is, uh, uh, this is how you know, different allocation approaches break, break down. They're either manual or there's some form of automatic, which is often this garbage collection. Does this make sense? Questions on this? Well, uh, we're going over pros and cons, I think. So uh, an excellent point. Um, the main downside to garbage collection is the overhead. That we have to either keep track of, ex of extra information, we have to periodically do these sweeps of memory, um, uh, and uh, we don't have to deal with that. We don't have to pay the price for that overhead if the programmer is just explicitly controlling exactly when memory is allocated and deallocated. Um, of course, the downside is programmers are not perfect. Far from it. And so if you put the programmer completely in charge of memory, then the programmer can introduce all sorts of problems where memory is concerned, often in the form of a memory leak, some allocation that is never freed. And so if the program runs for a while, it just keep, builds up more and more memory that it's never freeing, um, and uh, can even sort of crash a system by running it completely out of memory. So it's really, we pay overhead to have this sort of managed in a much more kind of robust and, and bug-free way. Other questions? So at a, at a fundamental level, what is uh, an allocator doing. It is
And at, a, at a high level, an allocator is organizing the heap, kind of our region of memory where we're kind of dynamically allocating memory as we go along. It's organizing this heap as a collection of blocks of memory. Uh, these blocks are either allocated or free. The allocator has to keep track of this somehow. And it's responsible for, say, when I call malloc, deciding which of these free blocks currently on the heap is going to be used uh, to satisfy that allocation. So if we kind of look at a simplified version of this, uh, that I have uh, paired in a, or that I have as a spreadsheet. So let me zoom in. So here's our here's our heap. Uh, currently does not have anything allocated in it. Each of these cells I'm treating as an eight byte word. So for one, our, our allocator is always going to sort of round allocations to these eight byte uh, uh, words in order that they be aligned, like uh, we were talking, talk, talking about other things being aligned, that we wouldn't want to allocate some chunk that was sort of not aligned because then whatever the user say puts in that piece of memory on the heap would also not be aligned. Um, and we have a series of calls to, to malloc, including a call to free here. So this first p1 equals malloc 32, uh, the allocator might just grab the first 32 bytes of the heap, uh, say, okay, this is going to be uh, your allocation, and then it would return P, uh, uh, this malloc would return a pointer to the start of this chunk of 32 bytes. So P1 would point to the first uh, byte here, and would, uh, and then the user could could kind of write to the these 32 bytes on the heap using that pointer. If we kind of come down to this uh, next request, P2 equals malloc 40. The allocator could say uh, here are kind of 40 bytes um, to satisfy this request. Uh, however, the uh, uh, malloc will likely uh, not want to just have this request be 40 bytes because uh, on a 64-bit system, uh, malloc will typically align things to 16-byte boundaries. So in this case, we're very likely to see kind of one, uh, uh, one eight-byte word of internal fragmentation. So the allocator says, okay, the 40 bytes that, that the user asked for, return a pointer to that here, and then include in that block, in terms of kind of malloc's perspective, these eight bytes of um, uh, internal uh, fragmentation meaning that there's sort of wasted space that's internal to one of our blocks on the heap. Oops. Then if we have uh, malloc 48, we can take uh, 48 bytes, mark those as allocated, and return a pointer to the start of those as P3. Then when we call, uh, when the user calls free of P2, say, all right, P2, you are uh, deallocated. We'll just mark those bytes as free. And then we come to an interesting decision where the next thing that happens is the user calls malloc of 16. Where should the allocator put those 16 bytes? What? At the very end. Why at the very end? Because there's a perfect amount of room to maximize the data later on. 
Yeah, so this is one of the key design decisions when it comes to our allocator, and it's called the placement policy. And we'll talk more about different ways to approach this next time. But deciding, oh, should I choose the spot that is the best fit, the sort of is maybe exactly the amount that I'm looking for? Or should I choose the thing that's the first fit, just the first place I find that will work? So let's say that this allocator is not, is not best fit, that it's first fit. It just takes the first spot that it, it finds um, and says, all right, this is going to be D4, those 16 bytes. Uh, and then we come down to malloc 48. And can we can we satisfy this request for 48 bytes? No, we have what is called external fragmentation, which in this context means we have enough total free space to satisfy this 48 byte request, but it's fragmented, it's split up such that there is no contiguous chunk of 48 bytes available. And so this was a consequence of us putting our 16 byte allocation here and then breaking this up. Um, and if we had gone with Lev's suggestion of a best fit approach, we would have these 48 bytes free. But of course, a best fit approach might involve more searching through the heap to find the one that's actually the best fit. Questions on this? Qual? So like the, the decision on where you put this memory affect like the speed of an operating system? Uh, it, it, it affects the, the speed of, malloc and fr of the malloc and free functions uh, specifically. Um, and because those are used for everything, uh, that can then in turn slow down anything that's using malloc and free. What other questions do you have? Yeah. Um, could you clarify why there was an internal fragmentation? Yes, so we, uh, on a 64-bit system, we typically want to uh, align, uh, we're typically going to align blocks by 16 bytes, which just means make the block size a multiple of 16. So we got this request for 40, and we rounded it up to 48, so that it would be a multiple of 16. Um, if we were, Kind of another example of internal fragmentation would be what if we had malloc one, just give me one byte on the heap. Uh, malloc is going to round that up to either eight or, or 16, and those extra seven or 15 bytes would be internal fragmentation. Kevin. Wait, why does it round up again? So the first goal here is We want to align these blocks of memory on the heap um, so that the data that someone stores in them will be aligned. Um, and so if we have, say, malloc of 1, uh, we don't want to mark just that one byte as allocated because then the next byte isn't actually free, or we can't actually use it because it's not aligned to a multiple of, say, 16. So um, here is our one byte, and then we have seven more bytes. And we actually, if we're, say, aligning to eight, we can't actually start the next block until eight bytes after this. So we basically, we need to kind of mark these as not available. And the way we do that is we just sort of include them in the block that we allocated. Other questions? So a few points about what this, uh, what Malik is, is doing here.
malloc is not doing any initialization. It is just marking these bytes as allocated and then handing back a pointer and kind of whatever data is currently in those bytes is stays there. Uh, and it's the, the user's responsibility for initializing those bytes to appropriate values. Um, there is calloc or calloc is a version of malloc that does actually, you can tell it to initialize uh, uh, the value of the bytes in the memory it allocates. Uh, so all it's doing is looping through the bytes of the block and writing some value to each of them. So there is a built-in function that does that. Uh, there's also a library function called realloc where you can give it a pointer to a block that was previously allocated and ask it to resize it, allocate a bigger version of it or a smaller version of it. So, for example, you malloc some chunk of memory to store an array, but now you want the array to be bigger than the initial chunk, you might realloc. Um, and this lets the allocator decide uh, oh, is there actually nearby, is there actually like contiguous space that I can use to make this bigger, or do I need to find some new spot and copy everything over? And if realloc takes care of, of that logic. What? Um, so without initializing, how does a malloc call know where the last malloc call ended? Yeah, so this is, this is an excellent point. In the picture that I've drawn here, there is absolutely no information anywhere about how big these blocks are, how do you tell things. I mean, I've made them nice, a, a color to indicate they're allocated. Uh, now it can't just, you know, color in the heap to keep track of this. Um, yeah, so we're definitely going to need to keep track of some kind of metadata, some sort of extra information about each block to know how big it is, whether it is allocated or free, potentially other things. Uh, and so, well, that will be the first thing that we'll talk about next time is we're actually going to need to come up with data structures to organize the heap and keep track of this, this information. Uh, and different data structures will, as you might expect, have different trade-offs uh, in terms of, of their properties. Um, yeah, so I think that I will stop there for now. Um, I have office hours uh, at 3.30, and I will see you on Friday. Thank you.